Um, so we're very pleased to have Adam Kaywood with us today. He's coming uh, from the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio. Adam is originally from South Africa, but moved to uh, Scotland at the age of 14. He got both his undergrad and PhD from the University of Aberdeen. And he's recently, as of three years, yeah. right, um, joined the Southwest Research Institute. Um, Adam is here mostly because I asked him to come visit us because he works on fractures. So we have a lot in common. Um, he has experience in extensional contraction and strike sleep tectonics. He does a lot of remote sensing, uh, a lot of digital outcrop modeling. Um, I mean, the list goes on, right? But uh, he's going to talk to us about a stuff that you did in your PhD. Uh, yeah, mainly. Yeah. All right. Yep, yep. Okay. So cool. with that, thanks. thanks. The floor is yours. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, yes. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, digital outcrops, which I worked on for my PhD. Um, and as the title says, some of uh, some ideas around interpreting them, geological interrogation of outcrop reconstructions and where um, where potential sources of error might come from or how to mitigate against those potential sources of error. Okay, so a couple of slides. Let me try. Okay, uh, a couple of quick slides about Southwest Research Institute. Um, we're a nonprofit. Um, about 3,000 employees or almost just under 3,000 employees and we're the eighth largest um, employer in San Antonio. We've got 11 technical divisions and we do a really wide range of stuff. Um, everything from like testing of fuels and lubricants, testing of engines. Um, we sit in the space science division now, it's just been split up, um, but we, so we sit with a lot of people who do stuff like heliophysics, uh, planetary geology, that kind of stuff. So really broad, wide range of stuff. Um, that's a fairly recent aerial photo of our campus, really big kind of nice wooded um, campus, tons of labs and buildings all over the place. Um, recipient of quite a few um, R&D 100 awards. Um, and uh, the bottom bullet point here in bold is we've got a really, really strong internal research program. So really well funded. The Institute encourages um, scientists and engineers to apply for this sort of internal pot of money and to, to carry out their own research internally. Um, a lot of the work that I'm going to show you today comes from an, a couple of internal research and development projects. Um, yeah. Okay, and then in terms of structural geology and geomechanics, um, we do a whole range of stuff, a whole range of different scales, um, outcrop to subsurface, microstructure, we do quite a bit of wellbore and regional scale. Um, we've just completed a couple of projects offshore Canada where we looked at really long thousand kilometer regional cross sections, restoring them, um, extensional tectonic stuff. And then everything from stress analysis, geomechanical modeling, physical analog modeling. And then since I joined three years ago, uh, we're now doing more of this sort of drone based photogrammetry and using it to supplement field studies. So still doing the field work, still collecting samples, still measuring orientations in the field, all that good traditional structural geology stuff, but using taking the drones and using that to sort of add to the, the scope of the analysis that we can kind of do for structural geology. So that's that really. Okay, so a couple of slides on background. Um, so digital photogrammetry in the earth sciences has, has only really been around for like about 10 years or so. Um, before that, as you probably know, LIDAR was a big thing, ground-based terrestrial LIDAR, so those big heavy scanners that you would take around and move around, scan the outcrops, uh, merge the point clouds and create a um, sort of textured mesh or a point cloud. Um, but so around when when digital outcrops from LIDAR were getting popular, 2005, 2008, very quickly, soon after that, people started, real, there was massive availability of drones, um, consumer-grade drones that you could go into a shop, buy a UAV, fly it, collect photos, and start processing. Around the same time, there were big advances in structure from motion or digital photogrammetry processing. 
so the two and two the two went in hand really and very quickly people stopped using lidar because it's expensive it's heavy processing is really difficult um so it became suddenly really um much more accessible to researchers um so some of the advantages are that they can provide sub centimeter scale resolution and they can yield really large data sets for quantitative structural analysis um of course that assumes that uh, you've got accurate and precise data and that the data resolution is good enough for what you're actually trying to do um so some of the advantages rapid data acquisition uh, reduced time in the field and associated costs, um, better access to bites of outcrops that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get to on foot, uh, you know, things like steep cliffs or inaccessible terrain that you don't really want to be going up anyway. So it allows you to have sort of digital access um, to parts of outcrops and potentially improved scope for statistical treatment of data, um, again, provided if you're doing the right things with the data that you're extracting. Um, some of the potential pitfalls are resolution limits and sort of associated inability to discern small scale features. So no matter how good your virtual outcrop is or digital outcrop is, there's always a sort of trade off between how big it is and how the resolution of the model. Um, and you can never really get away from that trade off. So in the world of structural geology, a really good example of that is, say, an outcrop scale structure, say, 50 meters across, where you've got a beautiful, really high resolution photogrammetric model. Of. It's unlikely you're going to be able to pull things like slick and sides and kinematic indicators from them. So you really do need the field analysis for that part um, of the whole package. Um, and I think, as I'll show you a little bit later, um, automated approaches to feature detection we're still not really there yet. And a lot of people have been spending quite a lot of time and effort on approaches to say, digitally extract a bunch of fracture orientations from an outcrop model, or to be able to digitize fracture traces. Like it's sort of analogous to fault picking in seismic, um, but we're not quite there yet. And I'll show you why I don't think so. Okay, um, second background slide. So. There've been a bunch of studies over the last 10 years or so, um, one of which was, this is the first paper for my PhD, um, comparing field data with digital photogrammetry and LIDAR and trying to, because, because photogrammetry, digital photogrammetry was relatively new and the errors around LIDAR data were fairly well understood. People didn't really know how the methods compared, but it turns out digital photogrammetry does a pretty damn good job of, you know, reconstructing those outcrop geometries if you follow all the right protocols about sufficient image overlap, um, distance from the outcrop, um, sort of aperture on your camera, shutter speed, all those sorts of things. Um, control data is really important. So putting markers in the field on your outcrop and recording the locations of those markers with the uh, differential GPS, um, you need that sort of external control to get real, really nailed down uh, the outcrop, uh, where it is spatially, its scale, its orientation, um, and its sort of internal consistency. So if you want to be measuring orientations, for example, from one of these, you need to know where it is in the world. Um, so this talk is not about any of those sort of processing parameters, uh, acquisition strategies, georeferencing, all of that kind of stuff. A lot of what I'm gonna be talking about now sort of assumes that all of that's been done and you've used best practice to generate and process your photogrammetric reconstructions. What we're talking about today is really once you've made that model, how you get it from that digital outcrop model to the structural analysis stage. So in that pipeline of going in the field, collecting photos, processing the model, starting to digitize lines like you would in seismic, pull orientations, and then do the structural analysis. We're kind of in the middle space there. Okay. So this is probably what I just said, but um, so the controls on photogrammetric model accuracy, precision and resolution, generally well understood, bunch of papers about that. Um, so, and but the impact of chosen methods for interrogating 3D reconstructions, aren't really considered. And one of the things about, so I talked about how drones and photogrammetry software became much more accessible for researchers and they were able to go out, buy a drone, 
start flying out crops, generate a model. Um, one of the sort of hangovers from that is that a lot of people were generating the models without necessarily thinking about how good the data were, how representative the data were from field data. And you still see a lot of measurements or a lot of data reported in the literature where this stuff is pulled from digital outcrops, but there's no consideration of how how reproducible those measurements are, how accurate they are, um, and sort of what the uncertainties around those measurements are. Um, like I said, it's not an assessment of acquisition processing steps, and uh, the results here are primarily from that SWERI funded internal research and development project. Through the talk, um, I've got lots of little uh, digital outcrops to show. Uh, this is one from Ernst Naha and Big Ben. I guess some of you have been there. That you can just see there. There's a little knife. So that's an Opinel knife about that long. So there's a pretty nice little model. Um, and photogrammetry does really well with these types of rocks where there's lots of contrast, um, where, there, where it's all like, you know, gray or cream colored Buda limestone. The models are kind of, less exciting um yeah okay so one of the first things then is talking about whether uh so this is one of the questions that people have a lot is about whether interpretation should be done on point clouds or mesh surfaces this is an example from st anne's head in pembrokeshire southwest wales so kind of near my phd area old red sandstone devonian old red deformed in the veriscan or hercinian origin beautiful fold structures here um that's not what we're talking about but we're so this is an example of a point cloud uh if you look at the zoom on the right hand side here you can see so the the point spacing here is uh maybe 10 centimeters um so I should probably give you a little bit of background about how the models are generated from digital photos. So essentially the workflow is you put a bunch of digital photos into the software package. It then looks at all the pixels in all those photos and tries to find common features in each of those photos. And then what it does is, is it generates a point cloud. So the point cloud you can think of as your raw data from digital outcrops. It's the data set that's geometrically the most should be as long as your processing parameters correct the geometrically the most representative of your outcrop and everything you do after that generating meshes texturing meshes and stuff is essentially a sub sampling of that initial high resolution point cloud uh, the problem with point clouds themselves is they're often not that good to look at and they're kind of tricky you can see here if you were picking beds or fractures in the zoom in here it can be a little bit tough um, so what a lot of people do is they end up generating meshes um, and then projecting the, the image onto those meshes. It's like a texture on the on the mesh. Um, and you can sometimes see the details a little bit better. Um, so that there is a point cloud example. The next slide should give you a textured mesh. So you can see this is the textured mesh version way better, right? Um, and you can see it much more clearly. So if you're doing seismic style polyline interpretation where you're just tracing horizons, tick, 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 and the same thing for faults, I generally use textured meshes. And I think although geometrically they're not that, not as accurate as point clouds uh, for the visual representation of the outcrop, they're slightly better. Um, so that, but, but that's kind of the first pass interpretations would generally be do, done with meshes. Uh, take into account if you're extracting orientations, for example, you probably introduce quite a lot of meshing artifacts onto that point cloud. So uh, any orientations that you try and take from that thing might not be um, necessarily representative. Um, like I say here, good for large scale geometries, but less reliable for direct data extraction. And then sort of the third version of this I think of is untextured meshes where um, you don't see any of the photo texture on there, but these actually do a really good job of sort of representing changes in surface geometries or curvature. So I kind of think about this in terms of like, if I'm interpreting seismic and I use amplitude and then I might switch to cosine of the phase and I might switch to something else curvature just to check my interpretation. So switching back and forward between these different realizations of the outcrop is probably best practice because it you can often see things that you might not have seen the first time around, or you look at it 
with a, in a different sort of realization and you decide, well, actually that's not a fault. Let's kill that one and get rid of it. So it's kind of iterative. Um, so, and then the next thing is um, attributes. So each of these point clouds, um, when we talk about the raw data being a point cloud, it'll have X, Y, Z coordinates. Each of the points has an X, Y, Z coordinate and associated with those X, Y, Z coordinates are an RGB value, which come from the pixels in the photographs that were used to make the points in 3D. So most people tend to use these um, kind of RGB point clouds for interpretation and they are the most geological. Um, they're the ones that look the most like the outcrop. Uh, Heyman Formation, Eastern Marathon. I'm sure some of you have seen these, those really nice vertical beds on the side of the road when you're driving into Marathon. Um, so uh, RGB point clouds can be really useful if you if there is something about the color of the rock that helps with your structural interpretation. So the presence of a white calcite vein in gray rock, for example. Um, what it doesn't do a great job of though is there are often times where, so uh, you can see these rocks have got like, a, these beds have got like a sort of staircase pattern to them. And that's obviously orthogonal fracture sets that are making that pattern. These can be really tough to see in brown outcrop in brown point clouds, and you just, you can't pick individual fractures. So one of the things you should and could be using, but people don't really use them or uh, geometric attributes, using things like coloring them up for dip direction, which really, you know, helps these fracture and bedding surfaces pop out. Um, and so where exposures are three-dimensional, these geometric attributes can sort of provide, help to provide additional uh, information for structural interpretation. So dip direction there, uh, dip magnitudes, another really important one. And the, all of this information is contained within the point clouds um, when you do the initial processing. So it's just a case of tweaking the realizations, coloring your point clouds by these different attributes. But again, it's not something that's typically used when people are picking fractures uh, in digital outcrops. Um, and then you can use sort of combination attributes like uh, this is a sort of combination of dip and dip magnitude um, that allows you to pick up really small variations um, in sort of fracture orientations or bedding orientations. Um, so again, like analogous to seismic interpretation, I think best practice really is about, you know, sort of trying to generate as many versions of the same rocks as you can, as many, try and display as many of the different geometric attributes as you can to maximize your chance of picking every fracture or fault or um, bedding surface. Um, and using using them sort of slightly independent as independent checks on the, on each other. So if I pick a bunch of faults here, do they do they still look like there are faults or fractures here if I if I show another attribute? Um, okay. So that's a little bit about some strategies for initial sort of recon reconnaissance scale picking beds and fractures, looking at the digital outcrop um, at the largest scale. A um, couple of slides here on surface orientations. Um, so accurately measuring uh, the orientation of a geological surface um, is surprisingly tough with digital outcrops. Um, and really that's based on the fact that each approach or all different approaches kind of yield slightly different um, results. So this is what we're looking at here. This is a zoom in of that top image. Uh, this is Dimple Limestone, also on Highway 90 east of Marathon. Um, and so there are 4,244 points in this little point cloud on this fracture surface. And the average orientation of those is uh, dip and dip azimuth of 67031. Um, but there's a lot of variability in there. So the idea is, you know, you don't really want to go after if you're trying to measure the orientation of a particular surface, you don't want to collect 5,000 or 10,000 points and throw them all in a stereo net and, you know, do that sort of Fisher analysis and work out the dispersion of what the average is, the best fit to all of those. Um, the idea would be to go for something, you know, if, if one of the uh, 
advantages of digital outcrop work is to get more data quicker and more efficiently. The idea is to use something like a digital compass clino or to take a, make a three point surface and to figure out the orientation of that surface using a sort of simpler and quicker technique. Um, problem is, as it turns out, uh, all of those methods give you a slightly different result. Um, so the idea here is that, well, what is the best way to do this? What's the quickest, most efficient? What's the most reproducible? And which of these measurements allows me to quantify in some way the error associated with that orientation measurement? Um, so this is a three point surface. So, I mean, I think of this as a sort of fairly classical approach where you pick three points on a surface you make a triangle you report the orientation of that triangle um the problem is, is that this method is super sensitive to where you put your three points on your triangle and because of natural rugosity and bedding surfaces you can actually get differences of say five ten degrees difference in orientation between these different measurements so it's not uh, while fairly quick and fairly useful it's not great because it's really not very reproducible. Um, the image at the bottom you're looking at here is the, I think that makes sense, but that's the, the distance of the point cloud from that constructed surface. So reds are points that are far away from that surface, either above or below, as you, you can actually see it there, they're sitting above that surface. And blues are sitting further away below it. Um, so, and then the other thing about this method is it, it's actually really time consuming, like building individual triangles and move again and again and again for each surface is, takes a while um, and super sensitive to where you put it. Um, this is a mesh surface, so using a meshing algorithm in the photogrammetry software. Um, what you can see, I'm just going to skip back to the last slide. So we were looking at sort of maximum of 15 mil difference in point cloud distance to that triangulated surface. Now we're much closer, we're about two mils apart. Um, so not surprisingly, you get a really close fit to the point cloud. These dis they, Those points are not very far from the mesh. Um, the problem is that we've got 1,296 triangle orientations here. So it's not really helping us to make it any faster uh, or more efficient. Um, and again, you would need to have the extra step of analysis. So you would get all those triangle or orientations. You would do the analysis in stereostat or whatever on a stereo net, work out the dispersion, work out the average orientation. So although probably the most faithful representation of the outcrop, maybe not the, not the quickest or easiest. Um, importantly, there's no real reporting of errors or residuals in standard workflows. So it's surprisingly difficult to figure out how good your mesh is compared to your outcrop geometry, because a lot of those numbers are simply not reported in standard photogrammetry uh, software. You can do the analysis yourself, but you know that, that requires kind of extra steps. Um, okay, so um, this is, I think the last version I'm gonna show you, but so this is a digital compass clino. Um, so essentially you're in a 3D world and you use a tool and you say, okay, tell me the orientation of that or that or that. And you can set your circle size. Um, so, uh, you just say, okay, I want from wherever you want. And the, the data is instantly reported. The fantastic thing about this tool is your errors are always reported. So you always know what your root mean squared error is for each uh, plane that's fit to a set of points um, it's reproducible generally and it's super quick and easy so anyone who is trying to get surface orientations out of digital outcrops I would say that this is probably the best approach uh, using something that that uses a best fit plane uh, looking at the residuals or the difference between the the surface and the point cloud here uh, on the lower image we get back up to seven and a half mil um, not as good as the mesh surface, but a lot quicker. And again, uh, error reporting, which is really, so we get some idea of the dispersion around that um, constructed surface. Um, okay, so that's a little bit on surface orientations. A few slides on semi-automatic featured digitization. Um, so this is, 
This image that we're looking at on the right hand side here is from 2017. Um, and what these guys did, at the University of Melbourne, Sam Teal and others, what they did is they um, uh, generated a, uh, an algorithm for picking fractures or traces or faults uh, using a least cost path algorithm. So essentially how it works is you find a feature of interest, a fracture or a fault, and you pick either end of it. And the algorithm follows, it tries to join up the, the, those two points um, along the easiest path. Uh, and the cost in this case is the algorithm wants to go from a pixel that is similar to the pixel next door and so on and so on and so on. And the value that it uses is its intensity or brightness. So dark features, it follows the dark features, light features, similarly, it would follow. So uh, a vein filled with calcite, it would hopefully follow the pixels or voxels with uh, the similar intensity values. Um, generally thought up to thought to speed up the interpretation process. Uh, you can see here they've got uh, 54 versus 37 minutes, 57 versus 35. So that's a pretty substantial improvement on interpretation speed. Um, this is a semi-automated approach. There are some fully automatic approaches um, out there, but in my experience, they don't really work. Um, there have been some papers looking at um, some of the fractured bedding planes like in Millocaven or in Southwest England, you know, really clear fracture traces, really nice, crisp. You can see them from very high up. And their automated approaches do pretty well anywhere else where it's a bit not that easy. They don't stand a chance. Um, and you just have to do a whole lot of tweaking and parameterization to try and get it right. And in my experience, at least at the moment, we're still in a place where you're probably better off doing it yourself because um, you'll probably spend more time tweaking and tweaking and get, get a result that you probably have to spend a lot of time checking. Um, and again, you know, the accuracy and reliability of these tools is not, the fully automated tools has not been rigorously tested. Um, so one of the issues with um, the semi-automatic approaches, I'm, I'll show you in a second. Um, so this is from Canyon Lake Gorge, um, Comal County, just northeast of San Antonio. Um, and we had a benchmark data set here that we had um, a fracture study had been done by McGuinness and Thau in 2015. They did um, map fractures on a bedding surface using a differential GPS. Um, well, they mapped fractures manually, I should say, actually, in a notebook, they made a little map um, and then registered that map using a differential GPS. So that's kind of a, we use that as our ground truth data set to calibrate our um, automated fracture picking with or semi-automatic fracture picking against. Um, so here's a real zoomed in example. Um, of that bedding surface. So the greens here are those semi-automated fracture picks. So in this case, the user would have picked somewhere here off screen, the end point, and then the other end point down here. And these fractures are fairly weathered. Um, they have apparent apertures, which I think are much wider than their real apertures because of that sort of weathering effect. They've got the sort of, they curve into the bedding plane. Um, Filled in some cases with kind of dirt and a little bit of vegetation, we always do our best to clean these things out. But, you, you know, you can see that they have some width to them, these fractures. Um, and what, what happens here is that, so you can see that at first pass, the um, semi-automatic picks show a pretty good relationship between what look like fractures and the digital outcrop. Um, but the issue is, is that the tool goes along looking for its least cast path, the, the, the pixel or point that's closest in, in intensity value to the one behind. And you start getting some weird wiggles in the traces, which I guess you would kind of expect. Um, and this is always gonna be a problem if your feature or your zone of darkness is wider than your point in the spacing on your point cloud, right? So you're always gonna get this kind of wiggle. 
the issue, of course, is that if you start looking at the orientation of that segment, um, there's a lot of variability that doesn't necessarily exist. And that line is also longer than it is in the real world. Um, so, uh, and this is basically a graphic representation of the problem. Um, if, if you have some, if these, your points in your point cloud are not perfectly aligned, then you're gonna get all sorts of weird orientations in your semi-automatic uh, fracture pick. Um, all point clouds are gridded at some scale. So if you really zoom into these point clouds, um, you can see that they're sort of on a kind of a rectangular gridded spacing and you can't really get away with that, get away from that. Um, so that has an effect um, on where your path is gonna go. Um, and it's more pronounced in lower density data sets, but the problem never goes away, no matter how good, how dense your point cloud is. Um, but you can imagine if you had 30 centimeters between your points and your point cloud, this would be really pronounced, this kind of effect. Um, these are some rose plots for the same uh, fractures. So field mapping uh, fractures clearly are pretty variable, um, but a an approximately bimodal orientation distribution um, uh, approximately. Manual digitization was um, using uh, a really high resolution aerial imagery in ArcMap and just having a user pick fracture traces. Uh, but what you can see with the semi-automatic approaches, you get increasing sort of discretization of your fracture segments into orientation bins. And that's really just an effect of the gridded point cloud and the fracture trace is going like that. Um, and again, like I said, you know, implications not only for the orientations of the fractures that you're picking, but also their lengths. Um, yeah. Okay. A um, couple more slides on sort of interpretation approaches. Um, so one, one of the cool things about digital, at least what I think is cool about digital outcrops is they kind of allow you to test multiple interpretations. Uh, do a lot of rotation and looking at the outcrop at different viewpoints and different angles. Uh, this is an example from the Zagros. Um, I've never been here. We managed to get a paper from it, but uh, I haven't actually been to this outcrop. Um, but so what, what I have done in the past and what I did with this paper is did a lot of different scenario testing. This is a really complicated structure. Um, so, you know, I kind of think, again, I kind of think of it like um, seismic interpretation. So, you know, draw in what you can definitely see first and then start thinking about scenarios for connecting up those bits and pieces. Um, so this is an interpretation where just the horizons that we, we were sure about are picked and the same for the faults. Um, you know, if you think about the, so, an example would be this one. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of displacement on that fault, uh, probably a couple of meters. Um, and, you know, based on the scaling length, length offset relationships of faults, you would probably expect that guy to be a lot longer than he looks like. Um, but so the initial approach here was to just simply map in things we could directly observe and then start playing games with extending horizons, trying different approaches. Uh, you know, this, this took a lot of in iterations um, to get this interpretation. I'm still not 100% happy with it, but it kind of works. Um, so this is an, an, some inverted normal faults that were reactivated partly as thrusts. Um, but, you know, you, you get some geometries here where the normal faults are, have been folded a bit, it looks like, and little little reactivated horse and graben structures. Um, and, yeah, so then, you know, again, it's just about scenario testing. And so my supervisor did a lot of work on, um, she does a lot of work on conceptual uncertainty when doing seismic interpretation. And I think that if you're interpreting digital outcrops, I... I think there's no reason why we shouldn't be using the same kind of workflows and at least considering what kind of conceptual uncertainty there might be. Um, so the thought, some the kind of things that you might want to be doing. Uh, 
is considering and testing multiple scenarios, assessing geometric and kinematic validity. So in other words, using restoration techniques to make sure that all um, your restoration, the, all of your interpretations actually work. Um, and then again, as people do, as at least structural geologists do, when interpreting faults in seismic using established relationships, so fault length versus height, for example, versus displacement to critically assess uh, your interpretations. Um, not too many slides, I'm kind of going quite quick, but um, so a note on data projection, cleaning and classification. Um, so the way that we, that we tend to use these digital outcrop products, or at least I tend to use digital outcrop derived products is to make a bunch of interpretations, um, find a cross-section orientation that I think is most appropriate from field data, and then project those polylines onto a cross-section and move, and then do my stuff, you know, build the cross-section, do restorations, all that kind of stuff. Um, so to be able to do that properly, you need a couple of things. You need reliable orientation data, which you should probably have measured manually in the field rather than getting it from a digital outcrop, which may or may not be correctly georeferenced um, and representative of the geometries. Um, so then you need a projection vector that's appropriate onto those cross sections. Um, and then you need to do a certain amount of cleaning and subsampling your polylines because if you take a bunch of really complicated fault embedding polylines from a digital outcrop and project them to a cross section it's just like a splat of spaghetti sometimes um, so that's another consideration uh, this is from Langtree uh, on highway 90 west texas really nice outcrop um, this was a cool um, project actually so this is just uh, this was published last year, and these guys, my group, had been working this outcrop for a long time, or had spent a lot of time in that outcrop. Never had the digital outcrop model, um, but uh, David Farrell, my colleague at Southwest Research Institute, had a bunch of digital images that he'd collected like 10 years ago, I think, about 10 years ago, and there was enough overlap on them that I could make a photogrammetric model. And they had an old light, uh, laser scan that I could use to georeference the whole thing. So we had a digital outcrop, even though we didn't have a, they didn't have a drone at that time. Um, <clears throat> in this case, we were looking at um, sort of uh, thickening of the stratigraphic section, apparent thickening through fold amplification and uh, beef formation in between these sedimentary layers. Um, these black bits are estimated beef thickness um, through the fold. So I think the, we showed that amplification of the fold by 11% or 14%, something like quite a lot. Um, and the way that we calculated that was using a, there are some assumptions buried in here, but using a constant bed thickness um, and seeing where if you if you look at the model, what you see is apparently all of the beds get a lot thicker in the middle. And what we did is modeled what we thought the thickness of vein material would be between those beds and then checked them with field data. And actually, it turns out pretty close in places where you can actually physically um, access the rocks higher up, not really possible to check. Uh, OK, uh, another couple of notes on data projection, clean and classification. Um, so you always, kind of like with seismic data, uh, you always end up interpolating across zones of poor exposure or where you can't really see things properly. And that's kind of inevitable. Uh, no matter how good your outcrop is, how high the resolution is, there's always places where it's not wonderful exposure and when you need to do a little bit of interpolation. Uh, Resampling of projected polyline. So this is kind of an example. It's low resolution, but that's an original version that was projected onto a cross section. Uh, and it's just a note really to say that, you know, between this first top step and the middle one, there's a lot that can go wrong in that stage. And actually it's pretty time consuming having to iterate between the 3D and the projected version of your cross section to make sure, because what you find is often fault switch dip direction for some reason there's something about the wiggliness of that line and the outcrop morphology that when it gets projected onto a section it just re looks really strange so 
there's a lot of effort that should be placed into this stage of the digital outcrop interpretation um, back and forward between your projected version and the original digital outcrop interpretation. And then typically what we do is we do a stage of fault and fracture characterization. Um, so you might just be able to see them, but the yellows here are what are interpreted as um, extension fractures, the reds are faults, and um, the pinks are sort of incipient faults. But you know, to be able to make those sorts of classifications, you need to go back to the field, look for kinematic indicators, look for offset along faults. So it's not a case of just going to the field, collecting a digital outcrop, coming back, working it up, doing the interpretation. Um, if possible, and this is not always practicable, we couldn't go back to the Zagros and look at those rocks, but if possible, going back and rechecking your digital interpretations and checking your structural classifications. Um, so final couple of notes, one on field data. So really critical for assessing the accuracy of photogrammetric reconstruction. So what we typically do is collect a bunch of fault and bedding orientation measurements in the field. We were doing that last week. Uh, we mark those on duct tape on the outcrop, leave those on the outcrop, fly the drone, capture the model, all of those data then embedded into the digital outcrop. And then I'll start using that digital compass Clino tool on those patches next to the duct tape and see how similar or different they are to uh, field data. If they're very different, consistently different, if there's a consistent bias, there's clearly a problem with the georeferencing or something about the internal uh, consistency of the model. Um, observations and measurements below model resolution, really important. Um, you know, you can make inferences about whether you think a fault is a thrust or a normal fault or a strike slip fault based on, say, offset relationships and stuff. But where those get where your exposure isn't great or you can't clearly see those, and but you don't have kinematic indicators from your digital outcrop, you really do need that field data to back up those observations. Um, and then, you know, integration of digital data sets with field and lab data. So this is a study from last year. Yep, last year, uh, where we kind of integrated this digital outcrop, fault and fracture characterization type stuff, field data, and then XRD analysis of mineralogy. Um, in this case, it worked really well. Um, this was a study looking at um, the effect of mineralogy on um, fracture and fault intensity. Uh, the shades of blue that you're looking at here are clay, total clay weight percent. Um, so dark blue is more clay, light blue is less clay. And in this case, we found a really pretty strong correlation between fracture intensity and clay content. Um, and, you know, this, this would have been tricky to do without the digital outcrop, I think, you know, like even measuring fracture intensity can be really tough in the field. You know, 1D scan lines are okay, um, but for me, a 2D, uh, or a 2D intensity is, can be much better at capturing the variability within an individual bed or, or bedding pavement. Um, you know, you can imagine a horizontal scan line, uh, say in this top bed, how many of those it would miss. And, uh, you know, for me, this is a much more faithful representation of how many fractures there actually are in that bed than a scan line, 1D scan line necessarily would be. Um, okay, uh, final couple of slides. Um, so false color schemes, um, switching between point clouds, textured meshes and untextured meshes, really good, really important, um, good for checking your interpretations and good for independent checking of an interpretation that you might have made before. I think about it again as a sort of analogous to seismic interpretation and using all the available data you can. Um, in terms of orientations, I think best fit planes are the best, provide the most reliable estimates of surface orientations. And what I really like about them is there's residual error reporting, and so they're reproducible. Semi-automatic approaches can improve the speed of feature digitization, but artifacts may lead to errors. Um, and outcrop interpretation strategies, emphasizing scenario testing, like with seismic again. Um, Data projection cleaning and smoothing um, is difficult. They're 
it's, it's really easy to introduce geometric errors and artifacts at that stage. And it's something that I think people generally probably don't pay enough attention to. You know, I, my feeling is that a lot of effort goes into the initial stages of getting the best digital outcrop that you possibly can, spending loads of time tracing out little horizons and faults and then smacking it on a cross section and not really worrying about what geometric information you're losing between those two steps. Um, other data really important. So from traditional work, field work and lab analysis, and they're really important because you can circumvent the resolution of photogrammetry data. You can ground tooth digital measurements and you can obviously get data that photogrammetric reconstruction just can't give you. Um, finally, they're not a replacement for field work, but rather a complementary data set for improved structural analysis. And that's it. Questions in the audience? Um, you mentioned what you alluded to this, and you said that um, if you had, say, a an outcrop of dark shale that had calcite filled fractures in it, then that's maybe, you know, they're easier to see. Do you find, I mean, I know the Swari group works a lot on carbonates. Yeah. Have you found, um, you know, more strength in one kind of, I mean, you said, you know, where you've got color contrast right. and things like yeah. that, but. Uh, so we've done some very initial, well, I've done some very initial tests, but so my, I think. So we have some examples where for every five fractures we saw with our nose to the rock in the field, we picked one in the digital outcrop. Um, and those are in some mineralized hairline fractures in dolomites, not really very easy to see. You really need to be right up onto them. Uh, Can you like gorge? I think you're probably getting all of them depending you know those kind of weathered out fractures you, the relationships much more like one to one so it probably depends on the rock type the fracture fill the fracture aperture the amount of vegetation a bunch of different the lighting conditions um but i mean it's a bit of a niche research subject but i think that would be an interesting thing for me to or for someone to look into like what are those what are those factors that change that because one of the things about digital outcrops is they're so often lauded as this tool for speeding up fracture digitization and getting as much information as you can. But when you start looking at it in certain outcrops, you're missing so much. So if you could come up with some sort of universal relate, semi-universal relationship to at least have a ballpark idea of how many you're missing in hairline fractures and dolomites, for example, from a number of case studies, that would be a, maybe a valuable thing to try. Yeah. I have a question. Um, so one of the reasons why, like, I think uh, digital group models can be useful is mm. because you can map things that might not be as straightforward to map without yeah. them, right? So, for example, length of fractures yeah. and height. Uh, so every time I have tried to do it manually to pick these fractures on digital group models, yeah, I don't know where to stop. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, where yeah. to begin the next one. And yeah. if you have like two or three people doing the exact same manual picking, yeah. the answer is completely different. Yeah. So have you come up with some rules, some like, have you like thought about what to do about yeah. these biases? So I, I haven't. Um, so some of the things I've heard people talk about is one of the things people do. So Dave Healy at Aberdeen has got this rule when he's interpreting uh, ortho mosaics in arc map to always map at the same scale, not allow himself to zoom in or zoom out, which I think is probably a pretty good approach. Um, but yeah, and that thing about different users picking different things, totally. Uh, you know, so Claire Bond, my supervisor, did stuff in seismic data looking at that and like super different the answers. But um, Billy Andrews from, I think he's now at Liverpool, but he was at Strathclyde. He was one of Zoe Shipton students. He was looking at uh, exactly what Claire was doing in seismic data, but just uh, digitizing fractures in images. And yeah, totally different. But uh, so no, I don't have any. Uh... 
we have a question in chat, if you guys can hear me. We can. Uh, okay, Mark Helper asks, what is your take on the present prospects for integrating real-time photogrammetry and 3D models during gathering field data? Yeah, um, so I've I, there are some people who have been publishing a bit on that. So I think one of the things you can do is like with an iPhone now, you can do sort of real-time photogrammetry um stefano tavani has published a little bit on some of those things i haven't done any of it myself and i mean i think it might be useful for uh sort of conceptually uh if you're standing in front of an outcrop and maybe there's a big foreshortening effect and you can't see everything or well, maybe it gives you the opportunity to look at it in a different from a different viewpoint while you're in the field that might be fairly useful i mean you know the the negative about a lot of this stuff so th these models are great because you can rotate them and you can revisit the models again and again and again but you're not in the field and you need to wait until you're going to be back at the same location or you might not be able to get back to the same location so if anything i think that those real-time photogrammetry things are probably best for understanding broad-scale structural geometries rather than okay, there's a fracture that starts and ends here, you know, that sort of small scale nitty gritty stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh, one more. Oh. Okay. Uh, have you tried to map fractures using a high resolution digital no, DOM and uh, compare results to a lower resolution. Uh, so not quantitatively, um, and I'm sure it would have an effect. Um, well, I, I I have done a little bit of it, and um, but not. I haven't looked at the the statistics of those fracture populations. But I, what I would expect is that. So your fracture length would do, uh, well, it could do a number of things, right? So, you know, uh, you guys are probably aware of Noel Odling's papers with Norway fractured. Um, so I think what she saw was that uh, the effects of resolution were that, so you couldn't, you couldn't if image the tips of fractures so that they were longer in the real world than you were seeing uh in the aerial imagery so your fractures might get longer um but then if you've got something that looks like a single fracture in a coarse model but you zoom in and it's actually five fractures that are little segments they might get shorter i haven't tried it but i imagine there are all sorts of things that would happen to the fracture statistics um at different resolutions yeah I was going to ask one more. Um, so your Zagros paper, I haven't read it, sorry. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so the idea there was, did you try different interpretations and different restorations and compare them or? Yeah, so different interpretations. So, and the idea was that we, because we couldn't go back, but mainly using digital outcrops. Of, the paper is kind of a geoscience education paper and about students who have never been to a certain locality and probably won't be able to get to that locality uh having access accessibility or the ability to visit our crops digitally and then to try different interpretations uh, we tried a few um, i don't think we published on alternatives but those figures are directly from the paper so initial interpretations and then one of our end members um, but just ideas around geoscience education developing concepts students being able to do their own trial and error um at outcrops cool really world-class outcrops that you know it's unlikely they'd be able to visit yeah thank you so much pleasure